So please welcome our first guest speaker, Dr. Craig Getty. Dr. Getty is a medical oncologist at the Calvary Martin Newcastle. He is highly regarded as a brain cancer specialist amongst his peers and colleagues, and he's actively involved in brain cancer research. Thank you, Dr. Getty. Today, you uh, signed in, didn't you, with the uh, app? Can you get your phone out of your pocket? Just show me your phone. You, just, just hold it up. Did everybody sign in with the app? Yeah. 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 Everybody. Yeah. Good. Okay. I'll come back to that later. So, um, I've been asked to talk today to you about clinical trials, and it's uh, my Q's Foundation has been a really important part of my journey with clinical trials because having a, a cancer care coordinator in our clinics enabled me to think more about what we were doing and gave me the time to actually think more about clinical trials and really get excited and involved in brain cancer clinical trials. So I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the Mark Hughes Foundation. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about clinical trials and how, how I've experienced them. I'm going to just very briefly talk to you about a couple of the challenges that we face with them and the, and the problems that can go, that can sort of take them off track a little bit. But I'm also going to tell you about some of the solutions that we've enabled uh, to try and make clinical trials really work well for patients, and particularly with people with brain cancer. So those are, these are my disclosures. So when you work within this space, you often come up against uh, pharmaceutical companies and they'll often offer me relatively large sums of money. And I've been very careful never to take that money, but to divert it to other charities such as other cooperative groups, people that work in, work in this space. So, uh, and I, I, I get to go to conferences, sometimes overseas, because of my employment contract. So sometimes I'll take the money to do that as well, and so that saves the New South Wales taxpayer money, so you're welcome. <laughs> um, so, but it's it's a really it's a really it's it's delicate, and you've got to be very careful to stay uh, stay very clean in the system. So, I want to tell you about Dee. So, Dee was a young lady, is a young lady, who was always angry, always, always angry, and part of the reason she was angry is because she had cancer. And she had cancer throughout her body, including right in the back of her chest there. That's the, the scan of your, your chest. It's your heart in the middle. And then behind the heart, there's a piece of cancer where the lung should be. And that was actually a piece of cancer that was invading into her heart. And she had to have an operation there to stop that. And so she had a cancer that uh, is not brain cancer, but she had a cancer that there were some treatments for. But she was obviously pretty worried about a lot of the things that were going on. And she was always looking at her watch, and she was always looking at her watch and angry. Yeah. Angry with me. Well, she was angry because I was working in a very large centre in North America, and if she didn't get through our clinic appointment in time, and didn't get to the treatment centre on time, and didn't get to the train station on time, then she would have to pay extra for the childcare for her kids in the other suburbs of where she lived, and she'd have to work another day to afford the childcare because she was a single mum with three kids. So it was all... You know, it's all pretty, pretty intense. And we'd given her one treatment that had sort of half worked. It was half and half. It worked a bit. And we were running out of ideas for her. Um, and you start to scratch around when things are looking grim and you try and find some options. And one of the options that came along was a clinical trial. And we, we scratched it along. We looked at this and we went, okay, well, this is sort of like what you've had before, but maybe, maybe it will be different, maybe it will help, we'll see. And we started the treatment during the winter, and the winter in Canada is quite intense. And then there's more winter, but people start to, you know, hope that the winter's going away. And then it was spring, and then it was summer, and she was still with us. And 
that's actually not that long. You know, there's winter, 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 spring, winter, spring, summer. That's how it works in Canada. <laughs> and one day I looked at his scans, and that's what his scans looked like. And I was able to walk into her room until I can't see the cancer on the scans anymore. And that would have been more dramatic if the nurse hadn't already told her. God bless nurses, that's what I mean. But and that's the that's the ray of hope, right? That's the that's the absolute hope for all of us with clinical trials. And that's what drives you forwards. That's what drives you forwards as an investigator, as a, as a doctor, as someone who wants to help people and help people more than that. And you're always you're always going for that. That's what you, that's what you're aiming for. Let's talk about some of the challenges because sometimes it's not like that. Sometimes it's there are some there are some incentives that drive you in a different way. So the challenges that we face with brain cancer in particular in clinical trials is that that's. That's looking at all brain. That's all looking at all cancers in Australia on an annual basis. You know, it's always breast cancer, prostate cancer, so forth. Brain cancer is just down there in the in the bottom corner. It's a rare cancer, so it's hard. It's hard to get enough people in the same space, in the same the high, same hospital, the same position to do a clinical trial. It's hard to do research because it's a rare cancer and people are spread out in large just large areas. So that's one challenge. The other challenge is that the clinical trials when we run for brain cancers are tend to be slow. You know, you, you, it takes a while. And so um, those are, that's a graph showing you how trials are moving. So there's not many trials happening. So the, the, the low graph is happening. And then the, the number of trials that are actually reported is even lower. And so it takes on average about seven years for a clinical trial, for a, for a drug to move through from uh, does it work, clinical trial to does it really work. Trial, which is where you would actually then turn it into a real treatment. So it's slow, it's difficult. And the, the new waves of treatments in general for cancer just haven't been really helping. So one treatment after another has just not delivered a, a, a benefit. So whether that's the treatments that work to cut off the blood supply to a cancer, like turning off the tap, whether it's the treatments that try and use your body's defense system, your immune system, to attack the cancer, those haven't worked so far, but we're working really intensively, or whether it's the treatments that work like you're shooting at a target, a targeted therapy, a treatment that's really specific for, for one part of the cancer. Those have been very, very difficult as well. So all of these treatments that are working to a lesser or greater extent in other cancers have not been very successful in brain cancer. So it's rare, it's, it's, it's slow, it's, it's, and all, everything else that we're throwing in, it's not working. It's tough. It's really tough. And here's the... Here's the other little challenges that are, uh, you know, and this is the, this is my apology to you. The first one is academia. So academics, universities, that kind of thing, you know, we, we're in a race for survival ourselves in the academic sense. And I'm essentially, well, I, you know, I've got a conjugate appointment, but I'm not paid by university anymore. I, I do other things because it's really tough. The science, science is so underfunded. It's just the, the least funded, one of the least funded things in, 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 in general, with it being less than healthcare. And so when you're an academic, it's all about getting the trophy, it's all about getting to number one, because that allows you to survive as an academic. So our incentives become this alive. And, you know, that's what my academic career looked like. You know, you, just, you, get one, you get one setback, or more than one setback, and you're in the mud. And so it's really tough. So the people in that space are, 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 are trying to survive and, and distracted from maybe what's most important for the patients. And then we've got big business. We've got pharma, the pharmaceutical industry. So pharma is business. Pharma's there to make money. That's what they do, right? That's what they're there for. You know, it's not, you know, you don't want a plumbing business that runs at a loss because you go out of business. So pharma has to do that. But sometimes they're getting distracted and they're getting distracted to the point where they're not delivering the results we need. So here's a, here's a really, really, this is a very cynical example of it, but that's a graph to show you that there were 36 new drugs approved by the United States Federal Drug Administration, the FDA. That was between 2008 and 2012. Those, those 36 cancer drugs for lots of different cancers. And 
they were, a lot of them were approved on, oh, it looks like it, this treatment might be helpful. But do these cancer drugs help people live longer? And the answer in the end is no for most of those drugs. And it's unknown for a lot, a lot of them. And it's yes for a few of them, but only for a short period of time. So, you know, when your incentive structure is aligned to, I've got to you know, remain profitable, then we change the goalposts to, does the treatment do anything? Okay, we'll get, we'll get it approved by the FDA. Does it help people? So, that's society. This is, no, this is not people being evil or bad or whatever, that's society. They're incentives. So, lining up our incentives and getting, getting, getting that team together is what has been really inspirational for me. It's what the ethos that Mark Hughes has led, led us, right? It's all about leading teams. So we've been able to join teams to, to, to help. So let me tell you about some of the things that we're doing that we can hopefully overcome those incentives, those disincentives or those misincentives to go in the right direction to work as teams. So clinical trials currently look a bit like this, and my apologies to everyone in the room, but you know, I'm a boy. <laughs> and this is sort of what I did when I was a kid, you know, put together, get set puzzles. But this is what current clinical trials look like. You go to the, you know, the frontline hobbies, just go road, and you look at the kits, and you buy a very expensive kit model, and you put it together, and you've got one thing. You do it once, you get one thing. And it's nice, it looks nice, it's beautiful. But then you go, what did I do with that? Or the alternative is that you can still make models that are very representative, that are clearly communicate that that is a um, duck. <laughs> I put this myself. <laughs> I didn't even ask my kids to do it. The dog. And uh, it's probably not. Yeah. But you can, you can, do, yeah, you can make, <laughs> you can communicate ideas, you can build models that are very simple and pragmatic. And again, the last year has taught us how to do things pragmatically and simply and effectively in a really straightforward way. So that brings us to the MAGMA study, which I'm the, I'm the CPI of for, for, for Australia. And the Mark Hughes Foundation is a major funding uh, uh, part for that. Um, it was competitively funded through the Australian Brain Cancer Mission, so I do sit on the Mark Hughes Foundation Scientific Advisory Committee, but I didn't all the money to myself. So this went through a competitive process. And the trial is run by the, uh, is from the Cogno Cooperative Group, which is a national cooperative group. Um, and it's administered through the NHMRC uh, Clinical Trial Centre at the University of Sydney and it's supported by the Medical Research uh, Futures Fund and carries beans for brain cancer. And this clinical trial is not a fancy new drug. And it's not, you know, trying to sell you something exciting. And it's not trying to get academic ground points. It's trying to answer questions that are important to people with brain cancer. It's trying to serve you. So that's the group uh, that led that off. And my, my great thanks to the people at the CTC who are, who are doing a lot of work inside, the co-investigators across, across the country, and our consumer advisory panel that make sure that we're doing the right thing. So the treatment for glioblastoma or, or high brain brain cancer it's surgery, as we know, it's radiation and chemotherapy. So those are the standard treatments. And one of the things that you can do to extract better value and improve people's lives is use the tools you already have better. And that's the strategy. So we've taken a really pragmatic approach and we've done the, the, the design that we need. That's an incredibly important piece of engineering right there, but extremely simple. Right. Paper clip, absolutely essential. Absolutely essential. Come tax time, you go, oh, where's that paper clip? Did it hold the receipts together? But really important. So, what we're doing in, in um, the MAGMA trial is we're doing some experiments around the temozolomide chemotherapy. And the first thing we're doing is taking the key, asking people to take the chemotherapy early, as early as possible, as soon as they know they've got a brain cancer, long before they start the radiation, long before the you know, as soon as possible after they've had their treatment with the surgeon. And the second idea is to test whether or not it's useful to keep taking the chemotherapy for as long as possible, or whether or not the standard treatment, which is just six, six months of treatment, is enough. 
That's the, that's the two questions. And they're not big exciting questions, but they're important questions because they're easy to implement. And the do you keep taking chemotherapy every, every month forever is a really important question for patients. It's like, do you just need to get to six months and then you get a holiday? Or do you need to keep coming and seeing your oncologist every month? And when your oncologist is handsome, <laughs> Why are you guys laughing? <laughs> no, you don't want to be a patient. You, want to, you just want to be a, you know, you want to be normal. You want to be a person. You don't want to be coming to the hospital every month and a car park and waiting in the waiting, waiting room. So, here's their standard treatments. And this is what standard care looks like. Surgery, short break, radiation, and chemotherapy, and then six months of chemotherapy. Here's what the... the uh, first question looks like starting the chemotherapy as soon as possible after the surgery. And here's what the second question looks like. It's continuing the chemotherapy for as long as possible. And some people tolerate that really well, and some people don't. But the question is, do you stop at six months and three later? You later will just keep going. That's the question. Now, the graphics I'm showing you are on the video that we've developed for the patient information consent form. So we're innovating the way we do the clinical trial to make the clinical trial work better by explaining it to you with this video. So the other innovations that we're doing, so we're making the video easier. We're doing, as I was saying to the team before, we're actually also doing this uh, innovative idea, really radical idea of being fair and not being dicks, um, where we've taken the money in the trial and we're actually adequately paying everybody around the country to, to who's doing the work, we're paying them enough money for the work that they're doing. I know, radical idea, fair <laughs> sharing. <laughs> Very strange. But teamwork's a really cr cr critical part of this trial. So this is going to be a really big team. We've got 27 sites in total that are lined up. We've got other sites that are, that are bidding to join the study. So we've got, it's going to be the biggest brain cancer trial in Australia ever. Um, we've also tried to keep it simple. Those of you who've been to university will understand that a packet of two minute noodles can be transformed into gourmet dinner with a few spring onions and a half an egg. Um, gentlemen, not the way to woo a lady, but you know, um, still gets you dinner. So the simple things we're doing is this clinical trial is basically what you would normally do for a patient, standard care, plus a sample of their cancer, plus a blood test, plus a few questionnaires. Simple. Keep it simple. Get what the absolute things that we need for the clinical trial and don't ask for more. The other thing this clinical trial will do, Magna will do, is develop momentum. We'll con continue to develop momentum. It takes ages to set up a clinical trial. Ages. It takes a long time. So once you've done it once, you don't want to just stop it and then, you know, oh, well, you did it once, that's good. You want to keep going and do it again and again. So what we're using is a modern design called a multi-arm, multi-stage design. So we're starting with this control arm, the standard treatment, as I showed you at the top, and then with the two experimental arms, the, the, the early and the prolonged. And as you go out, you keep watching and you keep watching, and then you might have another idea, you might get another funding opportunity, and there's, we're always looking for another funding opportunity because we've got lots of ideas. Another idea comes along, you keep it. Um, asking patients to be part of it, you're randomising them to different, different arms of the study, and then you, you get to the point where you decide, no, that was a stupid idea. No, that, that idea was stupid. It was stupid to, to you know, eat jelly beans with your breakfast. So you stop it. You stop, you stop asking that question, you answer that question, but the trial keeps going, and you now add another arm. So this is, a, this is a design that's being used all around the world for different kinds of cancer, prostate cancer, ovarian cancer, and the prostate cancer one is running in the UK, it's been an inspiration for me for this. It's got 12 different questions so far, it just keeps going, to the point where it's open at 200 hospitals across the UK, and it's the standard treatment. The standard treatment for people with prostate cancer is to go on to the clinical trial. Not a fancy clinical trial, a simple clinical trial, but one that humbly asks patients to partner with physicians to ask important questions for patient care. So, as I said, it's the biggest, it's also the fastest. This trial's recruiting, we've just hit all the right notes in terms of respecting the sites, respecting the investigators, respecting the patients, making sure that it's lean and fit and it's growing as fast as possible. It's not gonna bring a new drug, it's not gonna test a, a magic whiz bag, it's gonna be a way that we can work together as a team across Australia 
and I hope New Zealand when we get funding, we've got funding application to bring New Zealand on as well. So uh, I'm really hopeful that we'll be able to build now an, an international team that will start to keep control of this audience. So that's, that's the MAGMA trial. Let me just give you a little bit of vision for the horizon and I won't take up too much more of your time. But one of the other ideas that we've got is a, a window of opportunity trial. So there's a window in brain cancer when people have the surgery and know what's going on before they start their chemotherapy. We're already looking at it with this early chemotherapy question. But it turns out that the part of the problem after surgery is that the cancer can regrow really quickly in some people. And so that rapid, those seeds that are the cancer, the cancer cells, they, they, they like the fact that you've just had an operation, there's lots of blood and healing hormones around, and that, that can actually potentially encourage the cancer to grow. And so about half of people with glioblastoma, high-grade brain cancer, the cancer will grow between the surgery and the radiation. And that for the half of those people that do, they, get, they live a third less than, than the people where it doesn't grow between the surgery and the, and the radiation. So that seems like a really interesting a window of opportunity. And so I, I love acronyms, as you might have guessed. Um, one of the things we're going to try and do is create a, a window of opportunity trial within that space called an ECLA, so that we can evaluate novel interventions in glioblastoma really quickly in that space. The standard treatment goes on around it, but we can see whether or not drugs have any impact in reducing that chance of the cancer going back, because it's going to happen if you do the people. We can test ideas really quickly in that space, rather than sort of waiting waiting to see what happens. So that's, that's not funded yet. That's, Still slightly pie in the sky and pretty pictures. But, you'll see what but let's talk, let's turn things on their head. Let's invert the way we do things. The way everything happens in brain cancer now is we do an operation, we understand what cancer is, we put on the microscope, and then we turn around and give treatment to the patient. What if we could change that paradigm? What if we could change the way that we think about cancer and the treatments for cancer? So many of you will have seen a, a scan of, of a brain. Uh, a, brain cancer and the oncologist goes, you know, that's, there's a spot. Because, you know, oncologists are not radiologists. But with machine learning and with some very interesting ways, we can actually get more and more information out of the scan so that we can learn more and more uh, knowledge from those MRI scans. And we can actually use different techniques to define new information. So, for example, this is a scan of a cancer and it's got a couple of peaks there. You've gleaned extra information. And those two peaks means that this is a low-grade brain cancer, a low-grade brain cancer, an IDH mutant brain cancer, which has really different implications for treatment and for prognosis and for um, how you should do the operation in fact. Compare and contrast, one peak, this is a high-grade brain cancer. So imagine if we could actually understand what was going on with the scans before even going to an operation. That would empower the surgeon, that would empower the patient. And you'd be in a position where you could ask different questions. We also have other ways of viewing the world. And so many of you will have seen a picture that looks like this and you'll, you'll have understood what this means. You'll have understood that it's going to be wet in Newcastle and it's going to be warm in Christchurch. And always to come in. It's going to be nice and, nice and toasty. But what you can do is also figure out ways of inferring information from other things, in this case, a blood test. So we're on the cusp of a number of technologies, and one of them in particular, that will be able to take a blood test. It's too slow at the moment, it's not accurate enough, but it's getting closer. Um, we'll be able to take a blood test and then be able to pick apart features of the blood test. In this case, it's methylation pattern of the circulating free cell-free DNA. I don't go into any more detail, but it's a way of getting a very accurate read of something that's going on inside that patient's body, that we can know whether something's a cancer or not, or what kind of cancer. And again, for example, there's that low grade, oh sorry, there's that high grade uh, glioma, so that's the, without the IDH mutation, that's the glioblastoma, and there's the lower grade, the IDH mutant. So we'll be able to take a, maybe a scan and a blood test, and if we've got them accurate enough, if we've got them fast enough, so now it's going to be able to engineer it. You know, we've got the technology, now it's going to be engineering right. 
we'll be in a position where we can inform people, help them understand before the knife goes in. That'll be a very, very powerful step. I'm not doing any of this. This is very smart people doing this. Very, very, very smart people around the world are thinking about this, and these are the kinds of opportunities that we want to bring to everybody with these kinds of ideas. This is one thing I am doing. Um, has, has everybody here got a Medicare card? Yes. Good can I say that? Yeah. Um, so your Medicare card is the only thing that the hospital cares about. I mean, did I say that? <laughs> um, the, the way, you know, healthcare in Australia is weird, right? Yes. Okay. Is, is it weird? Is it very weird? Healthcare in Australia is weird. We don't have a system. We've got, uh, we've got a, a lot of providers like Dr. Keller, Dr. Turner, myself, work very hard, we don't really have a system that ties it together. We've got states, we've got private, we've got general practice, we've got blah, blah, blah. One thing that ties it together is our Medicare card. Bless Paul, Paul. Bless him. Um, so the Medicare card actually tells us if an activity has happened, if you've seen a doctor, if you've had a scan, if you've had a blood test. It doesn't tell you what the result of that is, but it tells you that that happened. And the mere fact that you've seen a doctor or had a blood test is a really important piece of information. So the information that happens that is recorded about you is normal administrative data for billing by accountants, not for not for anything else. It goes through your Medicare card and goes through New South Wales Health when you touch a New South Wales Health facility like the public hospital. It's actually recorded and it's recorded routinely uh, through a number of agencies and with with people's prior permission, with everybody's very, very clear consent and permission, and with very high levels of security that maintain the security of that information. That information can actually tell a relatively skeletal but an accurate story of a person's life. So merely giving permission to follow what happens to you in healthcare from your, your administrative data linkage, as it's called, can actually tell a story. So when I we said before about how difficult it is, how expensive it is to do clinical trials and how hard it is, imagine everybody in Australia with brain cancer signing up for something where we're following their outcomes, where everybody in Australia can be part of the team. And how are we going to inform those people? When you hold up your phones a bit, right? You scan a QR code to come in here today. Everybody knows this. The pandemic has given us right two gifts that, that taught us how powerful we are together as a team, how that we all can tackle a public health crisis like a pandemic together. And they've taught us that we can trust each other with this kind of information. So those tools are there right for the plucking for, for and other healthcare emergencies such as cancer. So that data, that, as I said, can come together. It's in and of itself, it doesn't tell much of the story. But when you light it all up, it does, right? It does tell a story. So, I've taken you on a bit of a journey there, and I've talked to you about how we can do clinical trials that focus on patients and not on patients. I've talked to you about the importance of teamwork, not just treatments. And I've talked to you about how we can change our worldview and try and try and get new ideas that will let us completely disrupt the way that we take care of people with cancer. And how networks are more powerful than individuals. And with that, I thank you for your attention.